Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa jazalahu anna Muhammadan ma huwa ahlu ma huwa ahlu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So this is the third week I believe that we are that we will be continuing uh, this little 40 hadith of uh, the Prophet peace upon us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So the hadith now or the next hadith that we will be uh, reciting and going over is Yadullahi al Jama'a at the hand of Allah is over or is with the group. And this, this just means that hand, hand, um, we do not, so when, many times in the Quran, Allah would say uh, and use words that we as humans would define as body parts so in one instance allah said allah says that he has um one more so, so one moment uh, sorry uh in one instance allah would say that he has a shin allah says that uh, i believe in the quran it's uh, that on the day of judgment that allah will reveal his shin and in another ayat of the Quran, Allah says that everything is going to be destroyed, save his face, except Allah's face. And here the Prophet saying the hand of Allah. What does that mean? Does that mean that Allah has an actual face? Like you see my face? Does that mean that Allah has a hand like my hand? Does that mean Allah has a shin? What does that mean? Does that, does that mean that Allah is similar to us human beings? No, 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 no to all of those questions. So we Muslims interpret this two ways. One is that we simply um, say that Allah knows the meaning and that is it. And we do not try to understand it more than that because you can't really only Allah knows what he what he means right so that is one way we took like we interpret it we just say we just give the meaning to Allah we just say oh Allah you know what the meaning is and bus but that's that's it that's it another the second way that we interpret it is that we just give it a meaning that would that would uh still fall in line with Islamic principles Meaning that we do not take the words literally, and we just give them a similar meaning of what they could represent, right? So in this in this uh, particular hadith here, Yadullah, we would interpret it as Rahmatullah, meaning the mercy of Allah, al is upon the uh, is upon the group. So you know if if there was ever like a big bayan, maybe like Jum'a. And a lot of Muslims gathering and they're remembering Allah. They say, oh, Allah's mercy is descending upon them. Or you could say even maybe Allah's protection is upon them. Right? So similarly, uh, in the instances where um, these body parts come in the Quran, you give meanings like that. So when it says uh, everything will be destroyed except for Allah's face, it doesn't literally mean his face. It just means, it means his glory. Right? It means his 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 entity itself, like his entire being, will be his, will be everything else will be destroyed except for his entire being. However, he is wherever he is. And then in the end, and then um, in the other instance, when it when it, when it uh, makes mention of his shin, we simply say that means Allah is extremely serious on that day. In English, we have a a couple different similar, you know. Uh, um, examples of that you know sometimes you guys are playing basketball right you say oh bro but i'm getting serious now let me roll up my sleeves what does that mean so, well, it's game mode it's game it's game time it's time to go it's time to play with some seriousness so you roll up your sleeves or maybe you take off your jacket or something like that you do something in order to show how serious that you are being in this particular moment or sometimes um Let's say like you're about to have a race with your friend 
You say, oh, hold on, let me, let me, let me tie my shoes. Hold on, give me a minute. Let me roll up my pants. Uh, you know, roll up the bottom of your pants. So that is, and that is a sign that is uh, indicative of the fact that you're getting serious now. So when Allah says stuff like that, you know, hand, his shin, his face, etc., they try to give it like a, a a good meaning. And if we do try to interpret it, um, in the sense that, you know, uh, that well, sorry, we do not try to interpret it. Uh, in the in a literal sense, where that where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually has a hand or a face or a shin and the physical contents of the same way as we as humans do. We don't we do not interpret it like that. We interpret it just a, as I mentioned, just uh, to recap the two ways. One, we give the meaning to Allah, we simply say he knows what he means. That is all. And two, we 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 uh, change the word in, in order to mean something else. Yadullah would mean rahmatullah. His shin would just be like a, a, a figure of speech, meaning uh, it's game mode and they get serious. So the next narration now is Afdalul. Uh, well, this is wrong. So it seems like there's a little typo here. Uh, my apologies. So if you see my mouse, this is Zikri. It's not in Arabic. In in Urdu, you would say zikr, but in Arabic, it's not actually zikr. It's with the with the letter za. It's actually the letter um, val. So this is a slight mistake here. Um, that's okay. Uh, so the actual wording is afdalu azikri azikri. So it's not zikri. F is afdalu zikri. Af the lob, af the lob zikri. That's how you would say, it, not zikri, but that's okay. So, um, is uh, la ilaha illallah, wa af the lob dua, alhamdulillah. So, this narration now is saying that the, that the best way to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to say la ilaha illallah, and the best dua to make is alhamdulillah. So, uh, I really want to pinpoint this the, the the ending of of this narration here, but the beginning of it, I guess you can make a quick note and say that it is a way that Allah loves to be um. It is a way that Allah loves to be remembered by. An example is a uh, prophet, um, Yunus, salam, the one that was in uh, the belly of the whale, when he was trapped inside of it. He called out to Allah when no one could hear him. And he said, um, he said, Subhanaka la ilaha illa ant inni kuntu min al So in, in there, he, 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 uses, he uses the time when, when he says la ilaha illa ant. So this is this is a similar saying. That there's la, la ilaha. There's no God illa ant except you, O Allah. Illa Allah, except Allah. And that is a way Allah loves to be remembered. So try to do it anytime. You know, before you go to bed, say it quickly a hundred times on your fingers. Maybe when you wake up a hundred times, try to implement it some way or another into your life, inshallah. And then Afdullah Dua, Alhamdulillah. This one can be very power powerful if you say it with sincerity in your heart. Right? Many times, um, We'd, be going, we'd go through issues, you know, problems and problems in life. You, uh, you know, you're, you're whatever the case, whatever the case may be, you're going through, through through some difficulty, some form of a test. And you know, sometimes we don't really know how to be grateful or how to be patient. So the best way to to implement that and kind of change the way your heart feels into patience or into gratitude. It's to say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal, meaning I, I appreciate Allah and I show Him my praise upon every condition that I'm in, whether I'm going through difficulty or whether I'm going through moments of ease and, 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 and pleasure and, and, and happiness. Say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, ala, uh, alhamdulillah for, every, for every condition that I'm in. Alhamdulillah for, this, for Islam, right? 
Alhamdulillah for my life. Alhamdulillah for my mother and my father and my family. Alhamdulillah for the books. Alhamdulillah for my, um, you know, for a nice uh, cold lemonade on a, on a hot sunny day. Right? Stuff like that. Alhamdulillah. And I could have for everything. For everything. And many times I'm sure you guys even can feel, can feel its power in your heart. Really? Sorry, one second, guys. Right, so uh, pardon the quick pause here. Uh, so you say Alhamdulillah for everything. And I'm sure everybody can feel, uh, you know, the power in it when we, uh, the power in it within our hearts when we do make, um, you know, say the little dua. The next um, narration is, Inna min al-ilmi jahla. That verily, from uh, in some parts of of knowledge, is ignorance. All right. So um, when it comes to knowledge, you say that that there's some aspects of it that are. Not really to say that they're that there's ignorance, but rather you can say that they, that they're useless, that there's no benefit in it, right? And these this can be basically anything that does not um, help you get closer to Allah, right? So if someone so if someone studies, uh, as you know, Allah is always talking about history in in the Quran, talk about Mu the history of Musa, the history of Yunus, the history of Yusuf, the history of 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 Dawood. And, and Ibrahim and Adam and how and uh, Hawa. Allah is always talking about history. So when we learn about history, the knowledge of history, and it brings us closer to Allah and it makes us aware of His uh, of His being, and that will be a good knowledge, right? Or also how in Allah, when Allah talks about, um, you know, the stars and the moon and the sun and nature and birds and the earth and the, and the universe and the skies. Studying these things could be a good knowledge. It could be a beneficial knowledge if it brings us closer to Allah and it makes us aware of Him. Right? But some, but then there are also some forms of knowledge that are extremely useless, like black magic. Like black magic. There are there are people out there, even to this day. So it's not a it's not a matter of Oh, it's something in the past. People don't do it anymore. No, it is still a a reality, even to this day, that people practice it. They use it against people. Some people use it for themselves, and it is a, a practice, a, a a form of knowledge, witchcraft, voodoo, um, witchcraft, voodoo, black magic. You know, uh, I'm forgetting the 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 Arabic term for it. Uh, uh, sihr, sihr, uh, black magic. So well, that is straight ignorance. It is a knowledge. Some people can use it um, in order to get closer to Allah, but there is no benefit in it. Why? Because it's all harm. You're only harming yourself and you're only harming others. So it is a knowledge, but there is ignorance in it and it's useless. And it's haram too, obviously, to get into that um, at, uh, form of stuff. And an example also of nowadays that uh, I'm sure Maybe you guys might have um, seen on the internet or here or there is when people try to use numbers and um, they study them, right? People say, "Oh, eleven, eleven is a magic number," whatever that means, or they say twelve, twelve, oh look, four, 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 three, 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 and these repetitions, these repetitions of numbers, as, as in English as we say. It's all a bunch of baloney. It's all a bunch of baloney. So <laughs> it is just it's useless information that just end up taking up space in our brains and there's no benefit to it, right? Or the knowledge of, let's say, even basketball or cricket. Like, oh, did you know that LeBron James has a, has a 46, I don't know, point average when it comes to getting triple doubles or double doubles or 
something like right? like random facts like that. It's it's useless knowledge that's not benefiting us, and it is not getting us closer to Allah. And so I have it stuck in your brain for what reason, right? That's why there's a little dua that when we do ask Allah for for um. When we do ask Allah for knowledge, we say we ask Him for almun nafia, ask Him for beneficial, beneficial knowledge. So the next narration now. Pardon me. The best. Uh, the best. The uh, wait. The next narration now that we will be uh, re reading is inna yasir al riya. And even the slightest ostentation and good works is associating others with Allah. Ostentation basically just means to show off. It's a big English word that just means to show off. So you're saying that a part of shirk, not shirk as in like it's not like a like a super major sin where like you'll never be forgiven and you're no longer a Muslim. It's not like that. As there's level, there's different types of shirk. You have the greatest major shirk is to say that Allah has a son or father, or Allah is like multiple people, and Allah is not one, he's like two, three, four, five, ten thousand billion. Stuff like that. That's that's all major shirk. That stuff will take you out of that stuff makes you a, a non-Muslim. But little stuff like this that, that has um, little intentions in your heart or little defects or poisons within your heart, and these are minor shirks, they were called them. So you'll still be a Muslim. And this is really only if you intentionally with your heart, like with the sincerity of your, of your heart, that you have this, then it's like this. But if you get like a little waswasa and shaitan's trying to plug it into your ear, then you're fine. And and an example, I always like to give examples that way um it helps you inshallah uh, understand things. An example would be let's say you're going to pray salat to masjid, salat to isha or something, and you're praying, you're praying, you're praying uh behind the imam, and the imam finishes, and you stand up again and you go into your sunnah and you start praying your sunnah, and you now you're saying, and now while you're praying your sunnah, you stand up for a very long time. You stand up for a very long time to make, and in your heart, you're just praying, maybe maybe a long, a long surah, like Amma Yatasa'alun. You're reading that instead of Wal Asr. So, because you're reading a long one, it's taking you more, more time. No problem. But then there are some people where they, in their hearts, they stand up and they would, whilst praying these long ones, they would intentionally and purposefully elongate their salah in order to make the people look at them as if they were pious you know what i'm saying so some people when they're praying that they purposefully elongate or stretch out make their salah very long so that when people look at them they say oh look oh Achab. oh like he's a very good uh he's a very good believer he's super pious I think I think in, in Urdu you guys use the word buzuk. I remember buzuk or something. I remember uh, some of my friends using that. Like oh, he's a big buzuk. Like he's a big big sheikh. So pious, so pious. If we have those things. If we have those kind of things in our hearts, then it's not good. Or or another example is if you're giving sadaqa, and we spoke of this. I think maybe maybe the uh, a couple of classes ago. You know where where you go and give five dollars, but then like you're looking around and you're trying to see someone. Watch you give sadaqa. So then people, so then that person will make you uh so sorry, so then that person will think that you're pious. Like, oh look, hey Dawood, oh look, I'm giving five dollars for sadaqa, come on, look, look, look. Uh, I'm a big shot. I'm I'm uh, Mr. Big Shot. Stuff like that. So whenever as it says in brackets, it says in good works, in good deeds. And so we should never want to show off whenever doing anything. We should always try to strictly have it all for uh sorry, have um, our intention strictly for Allah. The next narration now is Man Samata Naja. And small uh, narrations, I guess. I want you guys to try to, inshallah, memorize them. 
I'm, I'm sure you guys should be able to speak Arabic, inshallah. Um, man samata najah. Man samata najah. This means whoever remains silent is successful or has saved himself. And in English, we have a similar saying that uh, silence is golden. Right? And this this doesn't mean that you become like a like a mute person and you never talk again for the rest of your life. But rather it means that you know when to talk and how to talk. All right. So right, it'll be let's say someone is yelling at you and person's like, hey man, yeah, you're a loser, and they're going crazy, uh, yelling at you, calling your name, being very rude. You can easily start yelling at them back. Like, hey, bro, I'm not a loser. You're a weirdo, man, with your big nose. And you start yelling back. And next thing you know, psh, 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 you guys are in a big, uh, big fist fight. All right? Or, in, or you could have done the same situation, just remaining silent and then avoiding the catastrophe of getting into a fist fight. The man says, hey, man, you're a loser, this and that. You say, all right. So, and you remain silent. You are now successful. Because one, you avoided right, a catastrophic failure in getting into a massive fist fight for no reason, and two, you're taking on, you're taking in all the good deeds, right? And and that's just that is one example like that. Another example is sometimes I'm sure this happened to everybody. It has happened to me a lot. That sometimes we would say something, and then later end up regretting it, or we feel very embarrassed, right? We feel very embarrassed. Like you, I remember a time, I can't remember what it, what it is exactly that I said, but I think I wanted to say a joke. It was with some of my friends, I wanted to say a joke. So I said the joke, and it was a very stupid joke. Like, nobody really ended up laughing. It was kind of awkward pause, like, okay, you know, <laughs> it was kind of like that. You feel embarrassed. That is obviously, I guess you could say, pardon me, you could say a, a bad example. But everybody wants to make a joke, and and you know, uh, nothing, nothing wrong with joking. As a prophet, make jokes himself. Actually, there's a couple of verses by him making jokes. But the point overall, but the point overall is that we know when to remain silent. Understand? We we know when to remain silent. And I believe I was reading the other day. I don't believe what I was reading. I was reading the other day. A statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab, I believe it was, um, and he said, I think it was him, and he said that um, I never regretted remaining silent, but I always, or I at times regretted my speech. We should always try to learn, you know, when it when it's good to remain silent in such things. And this, it, it takes time, right? Like as you as you get older. You realize sometimes it's, it's, it's good to say something. Sometimes it's better not to. Right? And, there's a, and also sometimes remaining silent also just means leaving people alone and not, call, and right, not being a, a bothersome. And I'll, and I'll give you an example actually of my own personal, another example of me in my personal life. I think I was going in a, a little weekend to Bligi Jamaat just for the weekend. And I met some brothers, and I think I, was, I just had a lot of like josh, like uh, excitement in me. I was talking a lot, a lot, a lot. And then one of the brothers looked at me. He's like, he's like, dude, you're very annoying. I hope you know that. And he said it to my face. He wasn't backbiting, as he was telling me to my face. He said, bro, you're like, you're you're very annoying. Like, you're just a very annoying person. And it hurt me a little bit. All right? I'm like, oh. And I realized just because I was talking a lot and I was kind of just being up in everybody's face, right? I'm like, oh, okay. And I realized, like, you know, maybe I should just not say stuff and just let people do their thing and not be all up in, in the camera, all up in everybody's face. So it's, it's like that, right? So the next the next narration is, Man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum. Man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum. Whomever emulates or whomever um, mimics or whomever mocks or pretends to be like a group is from them. 
So this um this has a lot of like connotations to it, right? And it um the the scholars of Islam have have if, if I may say have debated over like what exactly it means, right? Because like we live in the West, right? So sometimes like not, not every day of your life you're gonna be wearing the jibba. Sometimes when you go to school, you wear your pants and t-shirt, right? Or jeans or something. So if you wear jeans and people in the West wear jeans, does that or the, the non-Muslims of the West wear jeans, does that mean that you now are part of those guys? That you're like those guys? What does that really mean? So um Allahu Alam, Allah knows best. I think a, a simple explanation for it that us young guys can just you know, who are not scholars, uh, as young guys can just understand from it, is that whoever goes out of their way to be like another community or to be like another nation that are not that are not Muslim, or to be like another nation, then um, one moment, somebody asked me a question. Um, where was it now? Yes, so uh, somebody asked a question, my apologies. Right, so somebody who goes out of the way to intentionally be like another, to, like to be like another, um, another nation, and they're like them. And people nowadays call that uh, cultural appropriation, stuff like that. So let's say you have Tom, you know, a, 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 like a Caucasian, a white guy named Tom, Muslim. Everybody in my example is going to be Muslim, right? And he starts wearing like a Chinese dress. Sorry, not a Chinese dress, like a Chinese, like, you know, uniform or what have you. People say, well, that's, not, that's wrong. So in this, so an easy, an easy understanding from that is say that he's basically amongst those people now. But also, um, from what I remember this hearing is that the scholars use this uh, in terms of uh, when Muslims try to act like Kufar or or just non-Muslims, right? And they try to do things that non-Muslims do. But it's in the sense where you act like them and you start to do everything they do. So Christmas, we Muslims don't celebrate Christmas. We Muslims don't celebrate Halloween. We Muslims don't, don't celebrate birthdays or Easter or like um, the tooth fairy, right? If you guys know what the tooth fairy is and all of that stuff. So if you went out of your way to buy a Christmas tree to have it inside your house on Christmas, then yeah, like there's something wrong and you're acting like non muslim and you shouldn't be doing that. But this does not mean that someone is not allowed to celebrate their culture. Right? So, for example, if someone was uh, from somewhere in Africa, like West Africa, right? And West Africans, they have a very, they have a type of jibba. It's called the um it's called the bulbul, I believe. Uh if you type in West African uh West African Muslims, they have a certain type of jibba. So it's like the Shivadaka music, the pants and the the the, 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 the top like the shirt and the pants, but then they have like another over part to it. And it's kind of West African style, right? And then if you go with India and Pakistan, you guys have the Shivar the Shivadaka music. It's the top and the bottom. Right. And if you go to um, Morocco, right, their type of jibba is what? The short sleeve and the, the and it's, it's one piece of long cloth, like a regular jibba and a short sleeve. And it has a little design here on the neck, the Moroccan style job, job. I'm sure you guys seen it. If you go to Turkey, they have an overcoat. So Turkey, uh, Turkish people like their overcoat. So it's all a part of the culture. There's nothing wrong with, with following an Islamic culture, but rather it's wrong when you follow a non-Muslim thing, right? Or, uh, or a Muslim from one culture 
tries to go out of his way to follow the culture of another Muslim. So in some instances, instances that could be wrong. An example I can give to you is that in India or in Pakistan, men usually, it's not common, it's not the norm to get braids. Men do not usually get braids in India, Pakistan. Females might, but men don't. Females might, but men don't, right? But here in Toronto and maybe also in some African places, is the norm, or it is culture, where they get braids. I'm sure you've seen that. Here in Toronto, because everybody's so everything, everybody's a Toronto person, you have white people get braids, brown, black people, everybody gets braids, right? But um, it becomes an issue when a Muslim goes out of his way to follow another Muslim's culture that is not of its own. It's not to say it's haram or anything like that, but it can be uh, certain uh, certain issues may arise from it, depending on what, what he is following. So, you know, like us, when we were a Moroccan Juba, nothing wrong with it. If we were a, a Turkish Juba, there's nothing wrong with it, right? But an example is that, you know, if I were to get braids, you know, like my mom, my dad wouldn't, wouldn't not be up, up, or would not really be upset with me because it's kind of just a part of our culture. But then, like, you know, if a, if a, if a Bengali or, or an Indian or maybe a Pakistani, uh, a Muslim brother with the get braids, his parents may look at him and be like, oh, why are you getting braids for? Like, that's, don't do that. Why? Because in that Muslim culture, it's not a thing. But some issues like that may arise. Um, I hope, inshallah, everybody understands um, that little jargon of mine. Uh, so, quick moment. Uh, somebody did make a mention. They said that, inshallah, if we could go until around 8.30 to 9.00, um i don't know if, if everybody else wants to go that long so we may not go to nine let me be 8 15 8 20 inshallah if you guys wanted to uh we'll go until then or if not you have to go somewhere then you can inshallah so we'll we'll continue past our usual time of eight o'clock and we'll go towards 8 15 8 20 inshallah that's is enough we might be over Right, so I um, hope everybody understands the, the, the previous narration that we went over. Oh, if I actually may mention though, um, if you guys may be with me, is that when, when, when people, non-Muslims, become Muslim, like our converts, right? Like, like let's say in Jamaica, right, as an example, it's not a Muslim country. So if, if there were many different Jamaicans and they became Muslim, they are still allowed to follow their culture. Only the parts of it that are halal, right? So, you know, like listening to music, their music, that would also be prohibited now because music haram, right? Or um, certain dancing, certain style of dressings, etc. stuff like that, that would be haram to do now. It's not, it's not, that doesn't mean you're not allowed to follow your culture, you know? like eating the eating like jerk chicken or you know like jamaican foods and set it and you know doing certain things so there's nothing wrong with still having your own culture your own identity as a muslim there's nothing wrong with that if, if you are a convert or a weaver or anything of that of that sort so it really just comes down to in, your intention and why you're um emulating another group right The next narration now is Adunya Sejnul Mu'min wa Jannatul Kafir. The world is a prison for the believers and a paradise for the disbelievers. This one is um, pretty simple to understand because we are restricted, right? Like non Muslims are allowed to do whatever it is they want and whenever it is they want, however it is they want, right? Well, we Muslims can't, right? We're, we're not allowed to do, we're not allowed to drink. Some people find pleasure in drinking. You know, we're not to eat pork. Some people like eating bacon and eggs as like for breakfast, right? Um, some people use interest to make more money and we, when we don't do that, right? People like, like listening to music. We Muslims, we're not supposed to, right? Um, 
and it continues, the list continues, right? Where non-Muslims are, are free to do as they want in this world, and we as Muslims are restricted. And it's like we're just trapped here, and we can't do a lot of things. But it is a prison for us. But if you reverse it now, and you kind of swap the, the sides, or the meaning, then it would be that Al-Akhirah is a Jannah. You, you basically swap it. So a dunya decision of mu'min would turn into al-akhirah to jannatul mu'min wa sijnul kafir. Or the afterlife now is the paradise for the believer and it is a prison for the disbeliever. So it's like that. So it's a, it's, this hadith is, is a pretty, pretty um, straightforward in its meaning. The next narration is Ana Khatimun Nabiyin La Nabiya Ba'adi. So I am the last of the prophets and there is no prophet after me. This one we might have to go over a little bit. Um as I think in the 80s, I, I believe it was, or maybe in the no, I think I don't maybe it was the the eighties or nineties, right? Um in a, in a town in in the I believe it was a little town called Qadiyan, uh, a, a man rose, and he became kind of famous. His name being, pardon me, name being, Ghulam Ahmed. That was his name. So this man came out and he started saying that, "Hey, I'm the new prophet." Like just recent, he started saying, "Oh, I'm the new prophet." And then at one point he also said that, that he is Isa. And then another time he said that he is Imam Mahdi himself. And he started saying a bunch of crazy nonsense. But some people now followed him. And they consider themselves Muslims. And they call themselves Ahmadis. Or the Ahmadi Muslims. I think you guys might have heard, uh, heard about them. Um, because of their beliefs. They, we don't we don't actually truly call them Muslims, uh, nor are they actually Ahmadis. They say they're Ahmadi because they follow Ghulam Ahmed and that was their name. But the real Ahmed was us uh, is us Muslims. One of Prophet Muhammad's other names is Ahmed. We follow the real, real, real Ahmed. The real, real the Ahmadis, and those guys are Qadianis. They they try to make it so that if you call them a Qadiani, um, they say that it's a slur. Like that, that it's a very that it's a derogative word to use, um, right? So if you're around them, don't use it, just because you know they make it upset with you. Um, but just know in your heart that that they are not really Ahmadis. Who you are. So back to my point now, is that Ghulam Ahmed, um, they they say that since a narration like this says. That the Prophet says that there's no Nabi after him, it does not mean that there's no Rasul after him. You can understand the, the difference. So the Prophet, we we mentioned when we talk about him, we say, oh, Rasulullah, right? Because he was both a Nabi Allah and a Rasulullah. So when he so here now, the wording, they try to trick you and use some some word play. They say that when the Prophet says, La, um, Ana Khatim an Nabiyin, that I'm the final Prophet, it does not mean that he is, I mean, it does not mean. One moment, guys. Right, so sorry about this, this slight change there. So they, so they use wordplay and they try to make it seem and lay a claim. That the Hulam Ahmed was actually the next Rasul, the next messenger, but he himself is not a Nabi, a prophet. So they say that it's still permissible to follow him. But that's not how, uh, that's, not, that's not what the truth is. Real Muslim scholars have, have, have um, understood this and explained it uh, like this. And I hope you guys, inshallah, understand. 
So our suit, a messenger. Um, is someone who brings sir a messenger is someone who, who, who obviously is from, is from Allah and they come and they tell the people about Allah and etc but they do not bring a new law a new sharia a new book they do not do that but No, my apologies. I believe I have a backwards. No, my apologies. Yeah, I, I believe I have, I have a backwards. My apologies. I have a backwards. So our our um our soul is is a person who brings a new uh book and a new sharia. So for example, Musa had what the the Torah, the um the Torah that we uh the that we call it, right? So. That was his book, and that was his new sharia that he brought. Uh, Isa salam, had the Injil, or as we call it, Bible. Right? Prophet Muhammad peace upon him, had what? The Quran. So that was his book. And Dawood had these, had the uh, the Zabur. I think it was. No, no, no. Prophet Dawood had um ah, uh, forgive me, I'm forgetting what it was called. But he had his own, he also brought a book. All right. Um, so our stool is someone who brings a new book and a new sharia for that community to follow. But a nabi, a prophet, as you translate to English, is the person who does not bring a new book, a new sharia, but they follow the one of the prophet before them. You understand? So there's two of them. You have a nabi and a rasul. A Rasul brings a new Sharia and brings a new Kitab from Allah. Allah and Nabi does not bring one and they simply follow uh, the commands of the person before them. Right? So, this means what? This, uh, so, this means that every Nabi, sorry, every Rasul is a Nabi. Automatically, but not every but not every nabi is a rasul. I'll say it one more time. Every rasul is a nabi automatically, but not every nabi is a rasul. And that is because in order to be a rasul, you have to you in order to be a messenger of Allah, you have to be a prophet. Right? Like you're a prophet of Allah, you're specifically chosen. Out from Allah, out of all the creation, you're specifically chosen by Allah. But what makes you a Rasul is that you bring a new, a new book, a new Sharia, right? So all of the bees are Nabis, but not all Nabis are Rasul. It's kind of it's kind of difficult to understand. But that's why I'm trying to break it down. So inshallah, for you guys, you guys understand what I'm trying to get at, right? A Nabi, a person. They just come to the nation and explain everything. They do not have requirements of a new book and they do not come with a new sharia. What a Rasul does, so like Prophet Muhammad was a Rasul of Allah, he was a Rasul of Allah. So he brought the sharia that we have, he brought the Quran that we have, right? But in order to be a Rasul, you have to be a Nabi, like a chosen person, specifically from Allah, right? So in order to be, in order to be a, has to be B automatically, but B is not A. But but a B and a, a Nabiun, a prophet is not a messenger. I hope everybody understands that. Put in the group chat, inshallah. If you don't understand, I'll try to explain it more. If you do, and handle the one. If you don't understand that part, just um put in the group chat, inshallah. So now, um, the other hadith is, Man salla alayya wahidan, sorry, wahidatan, sallallahu alayhi ashadan. So the Prophet, uh, Prophet, or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, 
if anyone sends a blessing, a blessing, sends blessings on me once, Allah will bestow upon him ten blessings. And this is simple. You know when you say like, oh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's one. Okay, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's two. So every time you say stuff like that, Allah will send the blessings on you. And there's other ways, you know, when you're praying, you say, um, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad ma sallayka ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun mujid. That's one. And Allah will send blessings on you. So it's kind of, it's pretty straightforward, it's just like that. And obviously, we know that on Fridays, you're supposed to send at even more, even more, even more. It's in, you know, when Salah, um, you say Salah, like you say, Allahumma Salah, you say the, 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 the dude of Ibrahim, the one, you know, when you're praying, Allahumma Salah, Ala Muhammad, Ala Ali Muhammad, that one. Or you could say, there's one another one. This one is, um, Jazallahu Amna Muhammadan, Ahu Ahlu, Salah, Ali Sunnah. The meaning of that is, well, Allah reward um, Muhammad, whatever he is worthy of, continuously. So that is one. And there's different little, there's English books that, that have, you know, uh, that have the different ways of, of sending salutations upon him, uh, upon the Prophet. So every time you do one, Allah will send 10 blessings to you. So always try to, to do more and more and more. The next narration now is verily the verily the rewards of the deeds, verily the rewards of good deeds are decided by the last action, how they ended. In the mal a'malu bil khawatim, in the mal a'malu a'amalu bil khawatim. So this is this is similar to the first one, I believe, that we went over. In the mal a'malu bin yat, the actions are only according to the to um intentions and now this one says that very the words of the oh did i not oh one more can you guys you guys can see my screen right okay oh, yeah. so i thought that is i thought i did not have it on my apologies All right so so this one now is uh in the middle of my little whole team that uh really could either based on actions like the last actions so for the first one it was your intention right and the sincerity of, of that. But this one now is also by the by what happens at the end of it. Right. And this one, I um it might be a little bit more tricky to fully understand. And how do I put this? It's basically the way the way anything ends up is how it will be decided. The way your good deed ends up is how it will, is how it will be decided. So let's say you're praying your namaz, you're praying your salah, and at the beginning of it, in your first rakah, you're thinking about the trees and forest and how much money you have in the pocket your pockets, and you're thinking about toenails and your hair and your earrings or whatever. You're thinking about a bunch of nonsense, and you're not focused on your salah. At the beginning of first rakah, right? But then, let's say you get to the second rakah, and you're like, "Oh man, no!" In your head, you're like, "Oh, I need to focus. I need to focus." And you fix your pockets on the focus, and you start bringing your salah better, more sincerity, and more focus. And then you finish your salah with a, with a lot of focus and a lot of sincerity. Then your salah will not be looked at as as though you are lacking in it and you're just being negligent. But because you finished it strong with much focus, then it will be looked at like that. Right? So so it's like that. And this is not to this is not to mean that just that I don't want you guys to get this confused. As we say in English, um that that um we say in English that the end does not justify the means, meaning that just because the the final ending of something is good, that doesn't mean the process of doing it is also good. So that's not that's not what a lot of this. But I, I do not think that's what this that this narration is is trying to make mention that you can do anything 
anything you want. But if the ending is good, then it's a good deed. And it's not like that, right? So um, an example for that would be, let's say someone wants to listen to halal music. I'm not gonna say the group name, but there's two guys, right? Um, and they take like Drake, right? Like his beat and put halal lyrics, right? So if, if Drake says something like, or if the beat in, right, in the song, and they, they use the same beat, the, like sim the lyrics themselves are different, but they go with similar tones, right? So um, there's one song that Drake did, uh, um, something along the lines of, uh, yeah, so the Drake, so Drake was saying something in his lyrics, right? And then these guys took the same beat. And then, and then in their lyrics, something along the lines of, uh, what was it? Um, said something along, the, something along, the, something along the lines of, uh, Zainab just approached me. I, to, I told her your haram. What is it? Zainab just approached me. I told her your head BFD. That's too haram for. That is too haram for me. Stay away from me, or something like that, or something like that. And they try to make it like. Like there's some pious thing now, but it's still music, right? So these guys, their their end result was that it's halal music, right? But the course, the the pattern, or you know, the the in order to get from point A to point B, they were at point B and saying, oh, it's halal music. But to get there, what did they do? They're using haram things, so you can't do that, right? You can't, you can't, um, the ends of the ends in English, as we say, the end of, of, an, of, an, of an action or of a thing does not mean that what you did was, was halal or what you did was right. And I think that's, inshallah, that's what this narration is trying to say, right? That you can't make something haram. We can't do something haram and then be like, oh, the end of it was halal, therefore it's halal. And no, right? Like, and it, you can see um, another example to understand this. You could use, let's say, let's say you're trying to uh, feed a homeless person, right? So let's say that, you know, that you don't have any money on you, but you want to feed him and get good deeds for giving it, for giving sadaqa. But you don't have any money on you to buy any food. So what do you do? You go steal a burger. Or you steal a bag of chips and a, and a bottle of pop, and you run out and you give it to him. Say, hey man, look, I just did a good deed. Look at me. No, it's not how it works. Why? Because what did you do in the process? You did a bad deed. Right? So that is what this narration is not trying to say. Allah knows best. But rather, I think what it is trying to say is that when you are doing a good deed, even though the, even though it may be insincere and disingenuous, that if at the end of you doing that good deed, you change your heart and you became sincere and you became um, genuine, then it will be accepted as sincere and genuine. I hope you guys understand the difference, right? That you cannot do haram in order to fulfill a, a halal and be like, oh, it's, help. it's, it's, a, it's a, good need, a good deed now because I ended off as a good deed. No, or rather, Allah knows best, I think what, it, what the meaning here is, is that, that if a good deed was weak at the beginning, but was, but was strong at the end, then it will be considered strong at the end. Like that. Allahu alam. And Allah knows best. Mm. If you want to walk out, that is actually final narration here. And this little 40 things. So for next class, I'm going to type out a couple of my own. I'm going to go over them also. It's now approximately 8.08. So I guess I'm going to I'm going to make mention of one final one and then inshallah that will be it. Yeah, yeah, you, um, you didn't mention it for longer, but maybe 10 is okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'll make I'll make mention of one last one. 
I was reading uh, just yesterday, actually. And I, I do not know if, if, if so I'm, I'm not going to say that the prophet himself said it. As the scholars, they said that uh, in regards to the narration, that it's, it's um, a lot of information. I don't know if you guys understand it, but basically saying that it's, that it's rewired, it's chain of narration is weak. So you can't really say if the prophet truly said it or not. But so I'm not going to say the prophet said it, but rather I'm just going to say that it is possible that the prophet has said, right? Or, or a good quote is that um, the, the um, I'm going to say it in English, basically saying that whenever you guys are trying to obtain a good deed, that you hide it. You hide it until it's until you don't show it. Right, so let's say you guys are trying to get a new job, as an example, or trying to get married, or trying to get into a good school, or trying to pat, or trying to get amazing grades, anything, anything where, anything where you want a lot of help with it, you don't go around and, and exposing things. You don't go around exposing the good deeds that Allah has given to you. If you got a new, if you got a new pair of good shoes, new pair of glasses, new token, new jibble, anything. Don't go around telling everybody about it. And the little narration says, it says, it says that it's like this, whenever you get a good deed, you hide it until it becomes reality and you truly have it with you. And then explains the reason is because every person that, that is through ni'mah, every person that, that possesses a good deed, that possesses a good deed is mahsud, is, is envy, or is or is a person that will be uh, looked at with, with the lens of jealousy, envy, but and also that they're jealous. Uh, not that they're jealous. What's the word for that in English? But but people look at them with jealousy. I think maybe I think it's just envy. Yeah. Right. So in a nutshell, basically saying whenever you guys are trying to attain a good deed, don't tell it to anybody except for people that you know are sincere and actually care about you. Your mom, your dad, maybe your closest friend, Abu Bakr, as an example. You don't go around telling the entire world. You only tell people you know that are sincere for you. Why? Because if you're trying to get that good grade, right, and you're like studying hard and you start telling everybody about it or new shoes or whatever, it's possible that, that them being jealous would interrupt you actually getting that good grade. It's possible in some ways because people will put like evil eye on you and such things and evil eye is real so, so so people could do stuff like that right so um whenever you guys are trying to do a uh, use something or Allah give you a, a certain blessing as we say in English keep it low key <laughs> right keep it on the down low keep it hidden until it becomes a reality and you have actually obtained that good deed then you can say oh alhamdulillah Allah had blessed me with this such and such but if Allah had not blessed you with it as of yet, and you go on telling everybody, then it is possible you may end up losing that good deed before you have it. You may end up losing it because of jealousy and envy. And you end up ruining something that you that you desired or that you were hoping for. All right. So you should always try to remain quiet with things and not expose ourselves. All right. Like if you guys are trying to get it into a good school or anything, anything in life that you are hoping for and you're making a lot of sincere dua for it, that Allah gives it to you, don't go crazy exposed, telling everybody about it. That, oh, look, 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 look. Keep it really low key until you actually have it in your life. Then inshallah, you can tell people that how Allah has blessed you. Yeah. I hope that was clear. So we did go over a couple of. Um, Possibly confusing different uh, hadiths today. If you guys have any final questions, please feel free to ask. If, if I myself didn't explain it well, if I was kind of speaking gibberish and not really speaking English, then please let me know. Um, was, was everybody able to like, fully understand everything that was kind of going on today? Yes, sir. 
Yeah. You, you okay, Yahya? Yeah, yeah why? Okay. And then M. Now I just wanted to make sure everything was cool. Well, then, if that is the case, then um, it's now 815. So we will. Uh, one of the guys in this house. Um, so, Jazakumala for coming. Assalamu alaikum.